I was out doing a delivery one late night. It was probably the longest drive I have ever taken for a pizza delivery. From the pizza place I worked at, it was a 20 minute drive which isn't too crazy out where I live. Plus, they ordered four large pies, so I figured it was a party and I would get a much bigger tip. Navigating the dirt roads at night was always annoying though. I pulled up to the given address. It was some old, sketchy looking building, literally in the middle of a forest clearing. There were no cars parked anywhere or any lights on. I put my car in park and called my boss. I asked him to reread the address at least three times to make sure I typed it in right, but that checked out. I could tell he was in a really bitchy mood, and he told me to at least knock on the door and check it out. He would normally get mad if we took back one pie, but I was afraid of what he would do if I brought back four. I was insanely unnerved, but got out anyway and forced myself to the front door of the building. There was no doorbell, so I just knocked really hard. I heard nothing and didn't really expect to hear anything. I was extremely disappointed, not because nobody answered the door, but because I was realizing that it was all a waste of time and gas. I knocked one more time out of desperation, and then began to hear some kind of rustling noises from inside of the building. I knocked again and yelled that I was the pizza guy. There was silence now. I felt a bit more uncomfortable now than before. But before I could turn around, I noticed something at the window. There was someone looking through the window. I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. All I noticed were their eyes. Their eyes were open wider than I knew possible, staring intently at me. I was disturbed enough by this and dropped the pizzas and ran back to my car. The shitty thing wouldn't start until turning the key for the third time. I drove off the grass and back onto the dirt road, but I felt the car rocking about, shaking and bumping. Something wasn't right. I didn't make it far from the building before I started hearing a sharp scraping sound coming from outside. There was so much resistance that I couldn't even drive the car came to a stop. I got out of the car to check what the hell was wrong. A chill ran up my spine as I began to feel like my heart was constantly skipping beats. My tires had been slashed and had completely fallen off the rim. Not just the front though, all four tires were slashed. I realized somebody did this when I was knocking on the door to that building. Instead of running, I got back in the car and locked the doors. I was so close to that building, I could practically see it from where I was if it weren't for the trees blocking the view. I dialed 911 and explained everything to the operator. She told me the cops would be over as soon as possible and that I need to stay hidden. I asked her if it was advisable to stay in the car or run, and she told me it would be best to stay in the car with the door locked. She asked me to stay on the line with her until the cops arrived. My whole body was shaking. In all directions, there was nothing but dark, seemingly endless forest. I knew it would take forever for the cops to get there. I was not comfortable with sitting in that car so close to whoever did this. The next part though, is what utterly destroyed me. It still shakes me to this day, and I hope nobody ever has to experience this kind of fear. As I was scanning all the windows, making sure nobody was outside, I looked in the rearview mirror, and there was the same person, the same person I saw at that window. Eyes open wider than ever. I could see now that it was a woman, and I could ever so slightly see a smile begin to spread across her face. I opened my door and full on sprinted into the woods, not caring how much noise I made. I ran until I was out of breath, which didn't take long, and I hid behind a giant log on the ground. I tried to cover my loud breathing with my hands, as I waited and waited for what felt like hours, until I finally heard sirens in the distance. 
I gathered up all the stamina I had left to run all the way back in the direction of the dirt road. Eventually, the glowing red and blue lights came into view, and I had never felt better in my life. They were parked in front of my car, investigating with flashlights. I came out yelling at them like a lunatic to help me. I fell to the floor and started to gag, almost throwing up from running so much. They picked me up and began to question me, to which I explained everything to the best of my ability. One of the two cars drove over to the building, and the two officers began to search the building. They came back with nothing except for a couple of spiky objects. These objects were exactly the same as the ones used to slash my tires. The cops guessed that it was some kind of sick, demented couple, being that I saw the woman, but unfortunately they were never found, and that still kills me to this day. I obviously quit my job right after that and started working at a local grocery store. I know that I'll never forget seeing that woman at the back of my car. I recently moved out, and I already have a horror story to tell. The house I moved into isn't anything impressive, it's just a house that's appropriate for one or two people. But I'd say right away, I started hearing weird sounds coming from inside the walls. I first heard it in the kitchen, and then in the bathroom, but on night three, I started hearing it in my bedroom. I was sure there was some kind of animal living in my walls. I just had to figure out how to get rid of it. The next morning, I didn't even have enough milk to fill the bowl of cereal. I couldn't believe I hadn't realized I needed more milk. In fact, I seemed to be eating up all of my food pretty fast. I woke up in the middle of that night to the sound of breathing. Not my breathing. It, it sounded just like the breathing of a person. I flipped the lamp on and it stopped. I chalked it up as my mind playing tricks on me after waking up. The next day was really hot, so I turned on the AC for the first time. I checked every single vent, and some of them weren't blowing any air, one of them being the vent right next to my bed. I peered through the vent with a flashlight. There wasn't even a duct behind the vent. It was just the inside of the wall. It seemed that whatever air duct was in there had been removed. Unfortunately, I didn't look into the air conditioning system while buying the house, so I didn't know about this. That night, I had to sleep in the heat with no AC, so I was up pretty late constantly rolling around and flipping the pillow over. Then I eventually started to hear the breathing again, but this time I was fully awake. I knew it was real this time. It was coming to my left. I looked to my left at the air vents. The sound was surely coming from in there. I grabbed the flashlight again and shined it in through the vent. I dropped it and screamed. There was someone's face peering through the cracks of the vents. The first thing I saw were their eyes, open wide and glowing. I screamed all the way down and out the house. I soon found out there was a crazy, dangerous homeless man living in my walls, and he had been eating my food ever since I moved in. I was doing some night hog hunting in the woods near my backyard. I was hiding in the tower I had built about a decade ago. In case anyone's wondering, I of course had a night vision scope attachment. I guess I'm what you would consider a hardcore hunter. I don't want to bore you with the unnecessary story prolonging details, so I'll make this short. And I want everyone to know that though I agree this story sounds far-fetched and crazy, it is nothing but the truth and I in a way actually consider myself lucky that I'll always have such a horrifying story to share. So, while I was sitting in the tower waiting for movement, it finally came. I took aim and found the source, but it wasn't at all a hog, or any kind of animal I was expecting. It was a person, a man wearing all black, 
black sweatpants, black shoes, and a black hoodie with the hood over his head. But that wasn't the freakiest part. He was dragging a sack behind him. My heart started racing. I was pretty sure I was witnessing this guy trying to bury a body. I continued to watch him, but then he slowed down, and I swear to God, it looked as if he turned his head up to me. I ducked down under the wooden walls of the tower, shaking in my boots. Yes, I had a gun, but just the idea of using it against a person is horrifying. I lay low, praying to God that he hadn't seen me. It wouldn't make sense if he could, though. It's practically pitch black out here. Or at least, that was my logic. Seconds felt like an eternity as I waited for the footsteps in the leaves to move elsewhere, but I didn't hear any footsteps. All I heard was the sound of a foot hitting one of the wooden planks on the ladder of the tower. I felt the entire tower vibrate and shake as there were two more steps moving up the ladder. At this point, I was asking myself deep down, am I going to be able to shoot someone? But for some reason, whoever was down there decided not to climb all the way up, as I heard them jump back down to the forest ground and began dragging the sack away. I think I stayed frozen like a statue for at least ten minutes before even peeking over the ledge again. The coast seemed clear. I had to get home and warn the police immediately. I hopped over the ledge and descended down the ladder. I turned on my pocket flashlight, which in hindsight was a stupid move considering the situation, and ran back in the direction of my house. I was only able to run for about 10 seconds or so when I heard the rapid, manic footsteps crunching the leaves from behind me. I took a look over my shoulder, and there he was, inches away from my face. I spun around and shot him in the shoulder. He stopped and screamed in agony, and I took that moment to finish my dash to my house. Again, in hindsight, I should have held him hostage somehow, but that doesn't even matter now. I called the police, who showed up within 15 minutes with a whole search squad, and I led them all into the woods to the exact location where I shot him. There was a faint yet noticeable blood trail spilled onto the leaves which led past the body bag, which the cops seized, and eventually right to the maniac, who was hiding under a log next to a tree. He was arrested and tried for the murder of Jin Quen Sakanaki, a Japanese corner store owner. I don't know the full story behind it, but I do know I won't forget this one for the rest of my life, and I'll also be telling it for the rest of my life. I'll never forget the time me and my brother snuck out past our bedtimes to explore an allegedly haunted house down the block. Yes, I said bedtime, as I was only 10 and my brother Luke was only 12. When our parents said goodnight to us, I went to Luke's room and we took a couple hand-powered flashlights with us and hopped outside through the window. Luckily, his room was on the first floor. Those hand-powered flashlights worked by constantly pushing in a little trigger that would create light inside the lens. They were noisy as hell, but they were convenient. Once we were outside, we just walked down the block, and in two minutes we were there. It was rumored by all the neighborhood kids and teens that the place was haunted. Everything about it was creepy. The older, more antique design of the house, the isolation from the rest of the houses, and the broken windows and rotting wood. It seemed perfect for a horror movie. We went around to the backyard, this was all my curious and confident brother's idea. I was scared shitless. The door was locked, as expected. I felt a bit of relief, thinking we might just go home, but my brother made a shocking move next. He grabbed a plank of wood laying in the grass and began smashing the already chipped window. Eventually there was enough of an opening to unlock it and slide it up completely. We hopped inside and began cranking those noisy ass flashlights. Immediately after entering the house, we both picked up on the fact that it was like 90 degrees in there, which was odd as it was a September night in the mid-70s. There was no graffiti or anything anywhere. In fact, it was relatively empty besides a few pieces of furniture that were clearly not worth taking along. It seemed we were the first to enter the house, shockingly, or at least from the back. We went upstairs to the main floor from the little den area and continued cranking the flashlights. 
That's when we heard the slightest crack in the floorboards from right above us. We both jumped. I tugged for Luke to leave, but he told me the place is old as hell, it's just house noises. I stopped cranking the flashlight at this point, and I urged Luke to do the same, but he only called me stupid for suggesting something so ridiculous. Then there was another crack in the floorboards from above us. He began walking upstairs. I didn't want to go up there, but I was not about to stay down there alone. I followed behind him to the upstairs. There was a door that led to a room right above where we were standing. I begged him not to open it, but he must have just wanted to be the big, tough older brother. He began to reach for the doorknob while still cranking the noisy flashlight, but then he stopped. I was confused. I could see in the dark he was moving his ear up against the door, listening for something. Silence. Then, the most deafening, nightmare-inducing moment of my life. A single bang on the door from the other side sent my brother staggering into the wall in pain, covering his ear. We dropped the flashlights and ran straight out the back door and back home. We were so loud when we got back that our parents found us out. We told them what happened, but they naturally didn't care and grounded us both for a week. Two nights later, I woke to the sound of something from outside my window and a glare of brightness sneaking in through my slightly opened blind. I sat up and my heart sank when I realized it was the sound of the crank to my flashlight. I stood up and looked out the window, and that's when it stopped. There was nothing but complete blackness out there after that. I woke the next day barely remembering what happened, and I still hope today that that part was just a dream. This story took place a long time ago, back in 2002, when Craigslist was in its early years. Many wouldn't know, but back in those days, Craigslist was a lot different. It was a lot more so an online garage sale, or just a place where people would list old things that still had some value that they were willing to give away. I got a basketball hoop, a hockey net, and a spoiler for my car all free in perfect condition in that same year. You'd be lucky if you found something like that these days. Anyway, me and my son were dying to buy a hockey net so we could practice in the cul-de-sac we lived in. For the record, this was before I got that free one I mentioned. Wouldn't you know it, on Craigslist there was an ad for a slightly used regulation size hockey goal for only $50. It came with a puck and two slightly used hockey sticks. I still have a picture of that ad to this day. It seemed like the perfect deal, but he lived about two hours away. I called the number he had listed, and he sounded pretty normal on the phone. He had a pretty deep dark voice, but nothing that would be off-putting. I remember his voice being a bit emotionless. He agreed to meet halfway due to the distance, said he'd put the stuff in the back of his pickup truck. He said he could only come after he got off from work though, which was much later in the day, way past dark. We agreed to meet at some rest stop off the highway. Me and my son who was 11 at the time took my wife's minivan, the only car that would be able to fit that huge thing. Within an hour we were at the truck stop, which was empty at this hour but was decently lit by three big light posts. I parked right under one of the lights and waited. A pickup truck pulled in off the highway right on time. He stopped right in front of me. I went over to his window, but then noticed there was nothing in the back of his truck. You Steve? He asked me. Yep, that's me, I said. Alright, my buddy's bringing in the stuff with his truck. The guy pulled up behind my car and put it in park. I suddenly had a bad feeling. I told my son to get back in the car and lock every door except mine. Two more pairs of headlights came off the highway into the lots. Surely enough, pulling up next to me, and not surprisingly at this point, there was no hockey equipment in either one of them. My heart was racing. I was worried. Not for me, but for my young son who I for some reason brought with me on this trip. 
a group of large men mixed with heavy set and muscular physiques stepped out of the two pickup trucks behind the first one. They eyed me from head to toe, giving that typical intimidation stare down. Then this bald guy wearing sunglasses said in a deep voice, Where's the money? I instantly pulled out my wallet and handed it to him, begging him to just let me and my son go. He pulled out like a hundred dollars and was pissed, expecting more. He then sent two of his goons or whatever to get my son. At this point I screamed and begged for him not to take him. One of the men broke the glass to the minivan back door and I vividly remember the disturbing, heartbreaking screams of my young son. What happened next was what I can only explain to be a miracle from God answering my prayers. A car was entering the lot from off the highway. All the men stopped and turned to look at it. As it got closer, my heart literally dropped in excitement as I saw it was a police car. The light suddenly began to flash as he got close enough to see what was going on. All of the men were back in their trucks within seconds, speeding off down the highway. Well, at least two of them. The truck in the back was caught immediately by the police car and backup arrived shortly. I explained everything to them and they got the men that were caught to rat out on the others surprisingly quickly. I guess luckily the guys in the back truck weren't very loyal to whoever their leader was, if they even had any type of leader. Believe it or not, I had a police escort all the way home to make me and my son feel safer. I don't want to get into all the legal stuff, but I'll just say that all of those men except for one was caught, and I'm pretty sure that was the driver of the first pickup truck. Needless to say, my Craigslist days weren't over at that point, but I have always been much more protective of my son and much more cautious of Craigslist meetings since then. There was once an isolated island off the coast of Scotland where three lighthouse keepers lived and were responsible for keeping the building intact. One day, when their monthly supply ship dropped in, the island was silent. No response from the lighthouse keepers. Eventually, the captain and some crew members went to investigate and found a disturbingly empty lighthouse. Two of the three waterproof coats were missing from their hangars and the kitchen was left in a state as if people had left in a hurry. The lighthouse log only added more mystery to the situation. The log described how one of the keepers wouldn't talk and the other continuously cried for hours. All this pain and fear seemed to be coming from what was referred to as a powerful storm looming in the distance. However, this begs the question, why were they so scared of a simple storm? They should have been safe in the brand new lighthouse, right? The log goes on to talk about how they all sat close together and prayed for the storm to be over. The final log states, the storm has passed, the skies are calm, and God is over all. Their bodies were never found and the cause of their death is still a mystery to this day. The most accepted theory is that they somehow got swept out to sea during the storm, never to be seen again. But one final detail remains, one that scared the captain and his crew to the bone. The powerful storm described in the log didn't exist. There were no storms reported in the area. In fact, the skies were calm all day. It was two years ago. I was called in to do the night shift, 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. at 7-Eleven since somebody called out. The store was located on a busy road in a rather quiet and rural area. During the night shift, you could expect anywhere from 10 to 20 people come in to buy a beer or something else. This one particular night, there was this one guy, mid-twenties, that came in. He started making weird noises, like loud yelling noises. I assumed he had some kind of mental disability. In fact, my brother has a mental disability, so I immediately felt sympathy for the guy. He walked up to the counter without any items, with his head facing me, but his eyes were looking up at the ceiling. I felt uncomfortable. I honestly didn't know how to deal with it. 
I tried speaking with him, but he only responded in loud noises. I kept checking if he was with someone outside, but he was alone. There weren't any cars in the parking lot, so I assumed he walked. He stood there for so long, looking up at the ceiling and making noises, that I tried to get him out by handing him a bag of chips and telling him he can go. I tried finding some kind of number to call for someone to help him. Then, out of nowhere, he finally turned around and walked out of the store. I felt so horrible for the man, but at the same time, I felt a bit creeped out. About an hour later, the phone on the counter rang. I picked up to hear the familiar yelling sounds of the man from earlier. It caught me off guard. I didn't know what to think, other than this has to be some kind of prank. I hung up on them and was now becoming paranoid of my surroundings, constantly checking the outside through the windows. Come four o'clock, the person working after me came in, finally allowing for me to go home. It wasn't my problem anymore. I got home and threw all my stuff on the table, ready to get to sleep. But my phone rang within a minute after entering the door. I felt a chill run down my spine. Why would someone be calling at 4 a.m.? I could only imagine it was bad news. I braced myself and picked up the phone to hear the man again. I felt sick to my stomach as I listened to the loud noises he made. I struggled to slam the phone to the receiver. All night, I felt like I was being watched, even with all the blinds shut, and I could swear I heard strange noises coming from all over my house. I refused to get any sleep until the sun came up. Weeks passed and I had forgotten about the incident, until one day, when going into the basement for the first time in a while, I found that papers had been scattered all over the floor, and when I went into the basement closet, I found writing on the walls. 7-Eleven had been written in Sharpie on the wall, along with the address to the 7-Eleven I worked at and my house address. The most disturbing part, I also found various kitchen knives along with a large pocket knife sitting in the closet. What started out as seemingly just an innocent person turning into something of a prank ultimately turned into something much more horrifying. He had been living down there for God knows how long and I'm just grateful that, for whatever reason, he changed his mind and left, because I haven't seen or heard from him since. All I can say is, that man is dangerously ill. About five years ago, I lived downtown in a major city in the US. I've always been a night person so I would often find myself bored after my roommate, who was decidedly not a night person, went to sleep. To pass the time, I used to go for long walks and spend the time thinking. I spent four years like that, walking alone at night, and never once had a reason to feel afraid. I always used to joke with my roommates that even the drug dealers in the city were polite, but all of that changed in just a few minutes of one evening. It was a Wednesday, somewhere between 1 and 2 in the morning, and I was walking near a police patrolled park quite a ways from my apartment. It was a quiet night, even for a weeknight, with very little traffic and almost no one on foot. The park, as it was most nights, was completely empty. I went down a short side street in order to loop back down my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of the street, on my side was the silhouette of a man dancing. It was a strange dance, similar to a waltz, but he finished each box with an odd forward stride. I guess you could say he was dance walking, headed straight for me. Deciding he was probably drunk, I stepped as close as I could to the road to give him the majority of the sidewalk to pass me. The closer he got, the more I realized how gracefully he was moving. He was very tall and lanky and wearing an old suit. He danced closer still until I could make out his face. His eyes were open wide and wild, head tilted back slightly looking off at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon of a smile. Between the eyes and the smile, I decided to cross the street before he danced any closer. I took my eyes off of him to cross the empty street 
As I reached the other side, I glanced back, and then stopped dead in my tracks. He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot in the street perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me but still looking skyward, smile still wide on his lips. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again but kept my eyes on the man. He didn't move. Once I had put about half a block between us, I turned away from him for a moment to watch the sidewalk in front of me. The street and sidewalk ahead of me were completely empty. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had been standing to find him gone. For the briefest of moments I felt relieved, until I noticed him. He had crossed the street and was now slightly crouched down. I couldn't tell for sure due to the distance and the shadows, but I was certain he was facing me. I had looked away from him for no more than 10 seconds, so it was clear that he had moved fast. I was so shocked and I stood there for some time, staring at him, and then he started moving toward me again. He took giant, exaggerated, tiptoed steps, as if he were a cartoon character sneaking up on someone, except he was moving very, very quickly. I'd like to say at this point that I ran away or pulled out my pepper spray or cell phone or anything at all, but I didn't. I just stood there, completely frozen, as the smiling man crept toward me, and then he stopped again, about a car length away from me, still smiling his smile, still looking to the sky. When I finally found my voice, I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to ask was, what the fuck do you want, in an angry, commanding tone. What came out was a whimper. W what the fuck? Regardless of whether or not humans can smell fear, they can certainly hear it. I heard it in my own voice, and that only made me more afraid. But he didn't react to it at all. He just stood there, smiling. And then, after what felt like forever, he turned around, very slowly, and started dance walking away. Just like that. Not wanting to turn my back to him again, I just watched him go, until he was far enough away to almost be out of sight. And then I realized something. He wasn't moving away anymore, nor was he dancing. I watched in horror as the distant shape of him got bigger and bigger. He was coming back my way. He was coming back my way, and this time he was running. I ran too. I ran until I was off the side road and back onto a better lit road with sparse traffic. Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of my way home, I kept glancing over my shoulder, always expecting to see his stupid smile, but he was never there. I lived in that city for six months after that, and I never went out for another walk. There was something about his face that always haunted me. He didn't look drunk. He didn't look high. He looked completely and utterly insane. And that's a very, very scary thing to see. So me and a couple of my buddies went camping last summer alongside the Willamette River. We actually had a decent hike into the deep end of woods. We did some night fishing, listening to music, and basically drank to the point where everything was funny later in the night. I would guess we finally called it a night somewhere past 2am. I shared a tent with one of my buds while the other two shared another tent. We heard them laughing about something. At first we laughed at the sound of their laughing. But it soon got annoying and we yelled for them to shut up. One of them responded, It isn't us. I sat up, startled at the response. I came to realize that it was the sound of only one person laughing, and it didn't sound like either one of my friends. Even in my drunk state, I realized how odd it was for somebody to be out this far in the woods so late at night. The laughing gradually got closer and louder to our camp out. My friend shot up and looked at me with a worried look on his face. I heard my other friends scream over to us that they were getting freaked out. As the laughing got even closer, I could make it out very clearly to be the laugh of a male, probably in his 30s or 40s. 
He sounded like he was as drunk as us, messing around with friends, but we only heard his laugh, nobody else. There was something indescribably creepy about his laugh too, as if it was missing something to it. You had to be there to understand what I mean. The laughing was now just at the edge of our campsite. <laughs> but we couldn't hear any footsteps at all. Now that may not seem like a big deal. It was impossible to move through that without making noise. And finally, all of a sudden, the laughing stopped completely. We had no idea where whoever that was was standing, as he hadn't made a single stepping sound. We sat there in silence looking at each other. My friend was clearly freaking out, but he was keeping it together the best he could. Finally, something broke the silence. The sound of something rubbing against the cottony fabric of the tent. We saw the outline of a hand through the moonlight, pressing on the tent. We both screamed at the top of our lungs before getting out of the tent. We ran as fast as we could through the woods, our other friends following us. After about five minutes of running, we somehow found our car. I actually puked from running so much before taking the wheel. I don't condone drinking and driving, but I still believe we were just in this situation. By far the most horrific experience of my life. No idea who or what the hell that was, or what they wanted. I was having a horrifying dream, possibly the most disturbing nightmare of my life. I was in my house, or the closest thing to my house that my dream could produce. Ironically enough, I was in bed in this dream, or at least I can only start remembering past the point of my lying in bed, and all of a sudden, the sound came from downstairs. I walked downstairs in the dark, not turning on any lights, to where I thought the sound was coming from. I was on my middle floor now. The dream was telling me to go downstairs to my laundry room, and so I did. But as I got there, expecting the noise to be louder and closer, it sounded like it was just as far as before. Now I was going upstairs to the kitchen, and it's strange, outside of every window was complete blackness, not general nighttime darkness. There was nothingness. I think all that existed in this dream was my house. Now my dream started to suggest that the banging sounds were coming from upstairs. So I went back upstairs, and was eventually led to the attic door. It was surely beyond that door. I opened it. There was an old woman standing by a bunch of boxes. She was slowly but loudly slamming her hand on one of the boxes, producing an unnatural sound. I tried to quietly step back away from the attic, but the old woman turned around opened her mouth twice as wide as anyone humanly could, reached out her arms, began to scream, and leap toward me. That's when I woke up. I thought it was just a horrific dream, but when I heard a bang coming from downstairs, a bang similar to what I heard in my dream, I felt my heart completely drop. On my way downstairs, there was another bang. It was the front door. I got the butcher knife from my knife holder in the kitchen, and crouched behind the door. I was waiting for the next time he would pound on the door and I would warn him to go away. I waited for a good minute in silence and finally decided to take a quick look through the window. There was somebody standing in my driveway. I couldn't tell if he was facing me or looking at me or not, but he was surely the one who was pounding on my door at four in the morning. He walked away down the sidewalk moments after he must have noticed me. The pounding on my door was the kind of pounding you would expect from someone trying to break in a door, not to get a house owner's attention. I thought it was just crazy and horrifying that the pounding and banging from this potential robber or killer didn't wake me up, rather became the key point to a horrifying dream. I was 19 years old at the time, working at a sketchy motel. 
The motel was pretty run down, and the majority of people who stayed there were locals that were just doing things they weren't supposed to be doing. Let's just say the cops came by multiple times a week. I worked as both a front desk person, checking in these creeps all hours of the night, and as a housekeeper who got to clean up their nasty, vomit-smelling rooms afterwards. One afternoon, I was working as a housekeeper in the second building of the motel on the backside furthest from the office. I hated working over there because it not only had the most worn down rooms, but it was always pretty vacant over there and way too quiet for comfort. I began cleaning one of my last rooms and wanted to get done in a hurry because it was getting late. I was washing the mirror in the room that I was cleaning when all of a sudden, I saw a man in the reflection staring at me. He was mid-fifties, dirty, with long, greasy hair. Startled, I screamed, oh my god. I told him he scared me. The room I was currently cleaning was vacant, so there was no reason why this man should have been in there watching me clean. However, we just had a meeting on customer satisfaction, and my boss was really pressuring us to be more polite and help the guests any way we could. Uh, sir? I asked him cautiously. Uh, can I get you anything? Towels? The man just stared back at me with a crooked grin and held out his hands to me. I thought maybe he was handing me a tip for cleaning his room earlier, but when I looked down, I saw he was holding a hundred dollar bill. Alarm started going off in my head. No one tips a hundred dollars on a forty dollar a night room. The man just smiled and said his name was Terry. He said he was staying in the room next door with his wife Sherry and sort of joked about their names rhyming. He smelled like car oil and alcohol. When I asked him why he was trying to hand me a hundred dollars, he laughed deep in his throat and said, Me and my wife were watching you, and we just wanted to have fun with you. I felt like my heart jumped into my throat. Um, no, I, I can't do that, sir, I'm sorry. I wanted to run out of the room screaming, but he was blocking the door, my only exit. The man smiled again, taking on a softer tone of voice, and invited me to come into his room to meet his wife, just to talk as friends. I nervously told him no again, and that I had a lot of work to do for the day. I prayed to God he would just go away, and eventually he did. He grunted and walked off in what I assumed to be the direction of his room. My mind began racing. There is no wife, I thought. This man could try and kidnap me. I was 110 pounds at the time and not very strong, he could easily overpower me. I locked the room from the inside and went directly to the phone to call my manager at the front desk, but the phone wasn't working. Adrenaline began pumping through my veins, and despite what I was always told not to do, I was panicking. Did he cut the line? No, I thought. This is, this is a crappy motel, it happens all the time, but I just have to get out. I remembered that I had my cell phone out on my housekeeping card, but that was outside the locked door. I'd have to open the door to get it. I cautiously opened the door to the room that I was cleaning and peered out. I didn't see anyone, so I frantically began searching my cart for my cell phone. I was wasting too much time looking for it, so I just decided to run as fast as I could and make a break for the front desk in the office. Then from behind me, I heard the man again, but this time he was screaming to someone else, she's running, she's getting away. I could hear his shoes slamming against the pavement after me. I quickly turned the corner, grabbed my keycard, and let myself into a stockroom and locked the door. Within moments, I heard the sound of the dirty guy and someone else running outside, searching for me. I stayed in that stockroom for 30 minutes shaking until I could no longer hear him searching for me. I finally got the courage to run the rest of the way to the front desk. When I made it there, I collapsed into my boss's arms and he called the police. The man and whoever else was in the room with him peeled out before the cops could arrive, and I was beyond shaken up. According to the police who ran a search, this wasn't the first time he had done something like this and he was actually wanted for sexual assault, gross sexual imposition, and in the past was once charged with rape. A few weeks later on what happened to be my birthday, this guy was caught. A few weeks after that I quit. I will never again work at another motel. Ever since I can remember, we've always had one of those old vintage Parker Brother Ouija boards sitting in our closet collecting dust. When I was a kid, I always wondered what it was. 
From the box, it seemed like a horrible board game, until one day I found out what a Ouija board really is, and immediately dug it out of the closet. I insisted on my brother trying it out with me, and eventually got him to play along. We put our hands on the planchette, and I began asking the typical cliché questions like, is there anybody there, and can you answer me? Other than my brother jokingly moving the planchette around to imitate an answer from some kind of entity, there was no real response. After getting bored, we put the game back in the box. I did a little research that night to find out how to make Ouija boards work. Many people said online that the most ideal environment when using a Ouija board is in a dark room only lit by candles. So when my parents weren't home, I managed to gather like six or seven candles and convince my brother to try it one more time. I lit the candles and set them around the table in the dining room with all the lights out. We tried one more time. I asked again if there was anybody there. The planchette began to move. I told my brother to stop moving it, but he swore he wasn't. I told him to move his hand away, and he did. It kept moving. My brother thought I was messing with him, but I didn't pay attention. The planchette landed on the word, yes. I was only nine, so I was legitimately shitting myself. My older brother had to take over. He asked the question, are you a good spirit? There was a five second pause before my brother's hand moved along with the planchette to the word, no. We both looked at each other, and at this point I ran to my room and shut the door behind me, but he continued on with the so-called game. I heard his muffled voice come from down in the dining room, when all of a sudden I heard him screaming at the top of his lungs. I ran back downstairs to see what was wrong. He was holding up his shirt revealing a small open wound that almost looked like a claw mark. He told me to set the fireplace immediately, and I obeyed. He threw the thing in the fireplace and told me to never speak of what happened to anybody. We have never used a Ouija board since. When I was a kid, my parents would sometimes bring me down to my aunt and uncle's place to stay for the weekend. Mainly, I'd spend time playing with my two cousins who were around the same age as me. They lived on a small farm with plenty of open space and we could run around doing pretty much whatever we wanted. If we thought we could get away with it, the three of us would sometimes cross over to the neighboring farm about half a mile away. It had been abandoned for decades, with a scattering of derelict buildings and other structures still standing on the property, just begging to be explored. This was of course a gold mine for three adventurous young boys such as ourselves, especially after my cousins told me stories about the deaths that took place in the house. It was pretty classic fare, man goes crazy, axe murders his entire family, hangs himself, returns every night as an angry spirit looking for new victims. Good, grisly stuff. Even at that age, I knew they were probably making it up, or at least embellishing old rumors. But seeing as how the setting lent itself so well to such tales, I allowed myself to buy into it. One afternoon, we decided to play hide and seek. When it was my turn to hide, I ran off for a flimsy brown barn that had living quarters on top and climbed the stairs looking for a good spot. There was still furniture inside, and personal belongings lay scattered across the floor. I maneuvered over broken dishes, tattered clothes, and crumbling books, eventually coming to a small room with a closet. Jackpot. There were even long black dresses still hanging on the rod that I could hide behind. I stepped inside and managed to force shut the folding door. My only illumination was a slit of sunlight that shone through the crack in the door from a nearby window. I crouched down with knees tucked into chest and waited. Some time passed and there was still no sign of my seekers. I waited some more, debating if and when I should give myself up. After nearly an hour, this was starting to get boring. My head drooped. I awoke with a jerk. It was pitch black. Drowsy and confused, I forgot for a minute where I was or what I had been doing. As it came back to me, 
The realization that it was now nighttime and that I had been abandoned here filled me with sinking dread in the pit of my stomach. I tried to get up, but a sudden cramp in my calf kept me grounded. I squirmed about, waiting for it to pass, when I heard a door slamming shut downstairs and instantly froze. One of my cousins? There was a brief period of silence, then footsteps at the bottom of the stairs. But not just footsteps, a thud too. After every other step. These weren't the footfalls of a child. They were slow, heavy, deliberate. I held my breath, praying they would go away. They did not. The noises continued to ascend. After another moment of silence, the walking resumed, this time along with a steady scraping sound, like something heavy being dragged across the floorboards. The footsteps made their way through the debris and wandered aimlessly through the various rooms. I thought I could smell something faintly putrid. The constant scrape sent cold shivers coursing down my arms and back. My worst fears were realized when the steps reached the bedroom doorway. They got closer and closer and finally stopped directly in front of the closet door. I couldn't see a thing. After an agonizing pause, they continued on over to the other side of the room and out the doorway again. They faded away down the hallway. I waited for what seemed like an eternity. There were no more sounds now and I was trying to build up enough courage to open the door and flee. Three things happened simultaneously just then. I was bombarded with a smell I can only describe as fresh roadkill. I heard raspy breathing behind me in the dark closet, and I felt hot breath against the nape of my neck. That was enough for me to hurdle myself out from the confines of that nightmare space, relying on memory and scant moonlight to navigate through the darkened house. All the while, I heard footsteps chasing behind me, closing in with terrifying speed. It was a clumsy, torturous escape full of trips and bumps and blind stumbling. I never looked back, at least not until I had burst out the front door and into the country night. And when I did turn around, I saw absolutely nothing. There were no more footsteps and nobody was chasing me. That didn't stop me from running though, all the way back to my aunt and uncle's house. There was a police car in the driveway when I got back. My parents were there too, worried sick. Everybody demanded to know where I had been. Apparently, when my cousins still hadn't found me by evening, they'd returned home to tell their parents. Eventually, the police were called in and informed me that they had already scoured every building on the farm. The insinuation that I was lying about my whereabouts didn't go unnoticed. None of it made any sense. It wasn't until years later that one of my cousins filled in a final piece of the story. He and his brothers had spent hours searching for me like they said, but the part they didn't tell anyone was that they thought they spotted me in the window of the bedroom I was hiding in, and when they got closer, they saw that it wasn't me. A young boy neither of them recognized was smiling and waving down at them and gesturing for them to come upstairs. That's when they ran back home. All of this while I slept in the closet. This story took place about five years ago on Christmas Eve night. It was around one in the morning, and I had just finished placing presents under the tree. I went upstairs to brush up and everything, then came back downstairs to the kitchen to get a glass of water before bed. My son Jake, who was four at the time, was standing by the stairs leading to the basement. I asked him what he was doing up so late. He pointed down the stairs and said, Santa. I picked him up and carried him back to his room. I took a glass of water and went to bed. I woke up around an hour later to my son running down the hall outside my room. I sighed and got out of bed. As I was going down the stairs, I saw Jake by the tree looking at presents. Then he ran past me and to the basement stairs again. He pointed down the stairs again. This time I looked down the stairwell and my heart dropped as I saw a black figure sitting on the bottom step. I almost screamed, but I somehow held it in. 
I pulled my son quietly away from the basement door and closer to the front door of the house. I moved my hand away from my son's mouth to reach for the lock in the doorknob. I tried to pull the door open as quietly as possible, but it was pointless. The squeaky hinges let out the usual ear-piercing screeches, and I cringed my mouth and eyes as I did. Suddenly, there were heavy stomps coming from up the basement stairs. I screamed and pushed open the storm door and practically threw Jake outside. I shut both doors behind us and we ran to the neighbor's house. I rang the doorbell as fast as possible, probably 30 times before they answered. After that, we went inside and stayed there and waited for the police. Whoever that person was was gone though, as determined after the police conducted a thorough investigation of the house. I ended up lying to Jake, telling him that actually was Santa Claus, but a few years later, he remembered the incident and became a little more wise to what actually happened.